see someone's notes left behind. Okay, don't know who those notes are. <laughs> Um, when most people actually first hear my job title, they usually assume that I work with the digitised collections at the Turnbull Library, when I actually couldn't be further from the truth. I'm many are surprised to learn actually that I work in the arrangement and description of unpublished collections and that I specialise in born digital materials. That the Turnbull Library is actively collecting, describing, preserving and providing access to born digital materials makes us pioneers. Very few collecting institutions worldwide can actually make this claim. Furthermore, they're usually even more surprised when they learn how long we've been involved in this activity. Like any frontier pioneer, we've had to learn by trial and error. Consequently, we've had to make some changes to our procedures and improve our practices. However, there's still some major challenges we have yet to resolve. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Like any good archivist, you need some context. So. The Alexander Turnbull Library is a library within the library. According to the National Library Act, and I'm just quoting here, the purpose of the Turnbull Library is to preserve, protect, develop, and make accessible for all the people of New Zealand the collection of that library in perpetuity and in a manner consistent with their status as documentary heritage and taonga. And I'd just like to emphasise that word, in perpetuity. It makes it quite hard when you're talking about born digital collections. Within the library, there's several well, large and well-respected unpublished collections which are, which are listed up there, um, which are managed by curators. Processing unpublished collections involves arrangement description, or what many of us call A&D. UNESCO defines this as the process of putting archives and records into order accordance in accordance with the accepted archival principles of governance and original order, respect the fonds. This is the guiding principle of archival theory, and I hope many of you know <laughs> what I'm talking about here. Providence. This is where collections are described by the organisation or the individual that has created them, and original order is the order in which the collection was fashioned by their creator, and this is retained in the description. All our unpublished finding aids are made accessible via TAPUI, our unpublished collection management system. And this is something I kind of have to emphasise quite a bit. <laughs> so all unpublished collections within the Turnbull Library actually do contain component of born digital materials. A lot of people are actually quite surprised by that fact. But what is born digital? It is digital objects that originate in digital form. This differs quite a lot from, of course, analogue materials which have been digitised or reformatted for preservation, um, like my colleague before me talked about. And I'd just like to emphasise, actually, this digitised image on the side here was actually taken the year I was born, and it's um, a man at ANZ Bank working on a computer, and, of course, banks were one of the first adopters, early adopters of computers. It's 1978, by the way. I think I'm my age. <laughs> Born digital t materials actually commonly come in to us in a number of carriers, as one's actually seen here, are actually all within our collections. Some people probably forget those old reels. We do have those in the collections as well. And many might remember when the first zip disk first came out on the market. Pretty amazing stuff. 150 megabytes. Wow. Oh, one disk. Um, we've even received entire computers to us. Um, been donated to us, sorry, um, Morris G's old Macintosh SE computer that's stored in our Curios collection alongside Catherine Mansfield's typewriter. So it gives a great compliment to the collections. But we also receive born digital materials via email and on cloud-based storage servers, like Dropbox is one. Born digital, by its very nature, is fragile. They're all dependent on hardware and software which is under constant threat of, of obsolescence. According to the conditions of the Library Act, which I mentioned, this makes it really difficult for us to consider, especially when you think the very first donation of any born digital objects into the collection was actually made in 1983. We commonly, from that point of time, we actually used to print out the <laughs> files <laughs> onto paper, put them in a folder and describe them as physical entities. This actually changed in 2000, uh, 2000 sorry, and we started describing them as physical uh, entities in themselves. This work was done by library staff throughout all the curatorial sections, but it quickly became evident to them that they couldn't sustain it. There was just so much coming in that they couldn't keep up with the work. So in 2007, my appointment was made. 
there was a number of things that were evident at that time. Um, Born Digital in particular was not given priority, mainly for a number of reasons, but primarily staff resources, but also because Born Digital really doesn't have a physical, obvious, tangible backlog. <laughs> Just goes on a server and stays there, it's invisible, they don't need to worry about it because it's not piling up around their desk. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> This meant the first part of my job was really to work on the, what was by then a quite considerable backlog in some of the collections. Um, and in 2008, our wonderful digital preservation system was launched, Rosetta. Now I just want to move on to three case studies which really illuminate the changes um, and challenges and improving practices that we've done regarding collecting and managing our born digital materials. Many might recognise this wonderful man. Um, Michael King, he was probably, well, in, in still many ways, New Zealand's, one of my, New Zealand's most favourite and beloved, <laughs> beloved, should I say, historians. We received his papers throughout his life, but we didn't receive his born digital materials until his, um, from his estate, um, which was in 2008, so quite a bit after he passed away. So much of the digital material was received nearly 20 years after its creation. And priorities meant that actually the files were not arranged and described until 2010, several years after the initial um, accession. And I've always actually argued in many cases, arranging and describing a born digital collection takes a lot longer than an analog traditional collection. You can't spread out a messy collection of digital files on a workbench and see just by glancing at them that they belong to each other and put them in piles. One thing that was really evident with this collection too was the fact that um, the analogue description had gone through the whole process and they had created 32 separate series. And if you're not too sure what series means, it really goes back to the whole idea of original order. It was putting them in groupings that was created by, the, by, the, by Michael King himself. And I want to emphasise, I would never create a series called Digital Files or ones based on their file formats like word processing documents or Excel spreadsheets. Please try to avoid that. I've tried to fix mistakes like that in the past. It's not pleasant. Um, and of course, I couldn't go back to the donor. That was I couldn't ask about the hardware or software in which the files were created or the nature of his work practice. For instance, it was really quite obvious, well, Pat, it was about, I was pretty certain, about 90% certain, he composed his emails in word processing files and then pasted them into emails and sent them. But I, or vice versa, I couldn't really tell, but that was one thing that was really evident. I just, but anyway. The collection actually contained 83 discs, both a Mac and PC, and you can see there's a zip disk and a couple of zip disks in there and also double density disks. This meant actually reading the disks was quite difficult. Required, I think, three different computers. <laughs> Joe knows a lot about this. <laughs> and the copying the files was difficult. And of course, another thing that was really difficult with this, sorry, with this collection was the disks were actually discovered during the process of arranging and describing that 2008 accession. And they usually were found in the bo bottom of the dusty boxes or into file within folders. But unfortunately, the person doing the description at the time didn't document where the disks were located. So that meant it really hard for me trying to reorganise them back into that series structure that was created. I knew that they belonged there somewhere, but it was quite hard. Also, there was no clear folder structure except for the disks in which the files were saved to. Of course, if you think of the size of those disks, um, there was no way that one of his books couldn't they couldn't be fitted under, they were about three or four discs probably for one of draft of his books, for instance. Like, you just couldn't tell um, whether or not those discs even belonged together as well, because you could tell there were chapters one to nine and then th 10 to 13 on one disc, but because they hadn't said that they were found together, I couldn't verify that they actually were the same draft of the, had the created at the same time, anyway. Um, yeah, and the file names were not always helpful in identifying the content. That was one that's, I think, a really big lesson with this. Just because it says it's something doesn't really mean the contents are exactly what they might say they well, appear to be. Yeah. Um, and also, the duplicate file names don't actually 
guarantee that their duplicates, you know, file naming conventions of a particular creator, they might just reuse that same kind of file name constantly. Um, and with this collection, there was, um, from the original 939 files, there ended up being 144 files, which isn't actually quite a, there's some bigger culls that we've had in our collections, which you'll see later. Um, and also the fragility of these files were compounded by the delays. I guess the discovery of the disks, their technical appraisal, their arrangement and description has meant that only in this last year, the la very last of his files have been preserved and made accessible, thanks to Jay. Over there. <laughs> I'll just give a little snapshot of what um, the collection looks like on our, that's the online channel if you're not too familiar with it, but you can sort of see this collection description series down the side. But yeah, just sort of get. And then moving on. Dame Farrell, um, he's a freelance photographer working in, um, he was based in Greymouth, but he provided an incredibly unique perspective on the West Coast way of life. He took photographs of sports teams, events of opening of the McDonald's, for instance, the tattoo and wearable arts festivals, and also privately commissioned photograph work. Um, we purchased this collection in 2008, and it is still to this day the largest born digital photograph collection we have. Um, his files were downloaded from his computer, and they were handed over to Turnbull Library staff. This was the first collection, believe it or not, in which the born digital component of the collection was given priority over the analog collection. It was a really well organised collection as a result though. Um, they were very well organised into folders, as any commercial photographer will tell you, they're pretty, pretty well organised anyway, if the customer comes back to them and wants reprints. Um, and the more, I guess one thing also, particularly because he was a photographer, is that the vast majority of these file names were nonsensical. They were generated by his digital camera, <laughs> of course. But the one thing that's really interesting about born digital files as well, uh, born digital photographs in particular, is that they have a huge amount of significant properties in their metadata, such as captions, copyright information, keywords, the model make of the camera in which the photograph was captured on, and even geotagging, and this is really, really important and actually greatly assists with, um, with arranging and describing. And however, I'd like to point out, of course, as you can see, there's still a very significant size chunk of analog collection that still has yet to be um, processed. So it just shows you the impact. We've put the emphasis on the born digital, and as unfortunately, has meant that the analog has yet to be arranged and described. So we haven't got it perfect. And that's just a little snapshot. And you can see some of his photographs. There's a lot more there. There's, there's a large collection, some fantastic shots in there, if you're getting a little inkling from that wonderful belly dancing shot. Then moving on to Keith Locke. Keith was a long-standing green Green Party politician and a son of a well-known uh, uh, um, activist, which many of you might know, Elsie Locke. Um, we made several visits to him in his offices prior to his retirement in Parliament in 2011, and where we discussed the arrangement of his born digital files, he was really keenly aware that they were, they were really fragile and needed a lot of work on them. <laughs> um, but this actually really helped us in the long run. Um, and on the last day in office, his very last day, <laughs> We went into his parliamentary office and downloaded directly from his parliamentary um, computer, noting the hardware, software, and so forth. And of course, one thing that was really evident with this collection was that um, the arrangement and description of both the analog and the born digital, were, were, they were described concurrently and a series structure was um, created using both of those. And I should actually mention that, um, of course, Still, though, <laughs> the digital specialist was working on the Born Digital collection, um, and I'll talk about it a bit later, but um, yeah. And the digital files were actually very well organised into clear folder structures, and there were very few technical issues with the files. However, there is a common practice within Turnbull Library, and it's maybe for other collections, where we tend to transfer collections based on format. And one thing, I'll just scroll through to. 
it's probably too blurry up there, but you can see there is one. There was a large, there's several transfers, one to the ephemera collection and one to the photograph archive. The photograph archive it was actually a quite extensive collection and it actually contains 6.42 gigs of photographs. And that is yet to be arranged and described as well. So even though we described the manuscript born digital side, we still, yeah, still got a lot of work to do. And that's sort of got some parting thoughts really around these and there's mainly questions and not many answers, but the vast majority of the born digital materials that we receive usually comes in part of a hybrid collection, which includes traditional analog materials. And I don't see this changing for a very long time. And it's important to note that the digital and analog collections are be created and used in conjunction with each other and they shouldn't be in isolation from each other. For instance, um, just thinking back to Michael King, and with many literary collections, they will usually create a draft on their computer, print it out, do hand annotations, then create a new draft on their computer, and then so forth and so forth and so forth. And I don't really see, I do it in my daily job. <laughs> you can see it. I'm not gonna change my practices for a wee while, I don't think. Anyway, and furthermore, of course, as I mentioned before, the arrangement and description of born digital has, is still being done by digital specialists when it's becoming more prevalent throughout the collections. Staff are being trained to gain more confidence, but this is taking a wee while. And in, in many cases, it's a very steep learning curve for many. And the size of collections. The size of the collections we're receiving are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. For instance, a recent donation we received contains 94,000 files. That's 194 gigs. <laughs> this has a huge impact on our resources, and the tools that we use to assist with these are just not sustainable in the long term. Do we need more specialist and powerful tools? Yeah, that would be great. But is this the only solution? Do we need to collect less or more intelligently? Personal digital archiving is becoming very popular, particularly with cloud-based storage systems. Um, and also the digital afterlife is becoming a big concern overseas. I mean, should our role really be about advocacy and education? It's just a question. <laughs> and curatorial management. Curators really need to consider and weigh up the cost of digital preservation when appraising collections in the first instance. In, in the past, they used to say, yes, we want it, but they're really having to look in a file-by-file -file basis at some of these born digital collections and having to reassess some of their collection policies. And I mean, the King collection in particular is a very good case in point. We, it was likely we would have never gone to the lengths that we did to ensure that his files were accessible if he was a less prominent or well-known or beloved writer. And I think it's a myth to think that born digital just because it's digital, that it, everything's automated. We still handle many of these files on a file-by-file -file basis. And also the curatorial management areas are getting blurred with Born Digital. You can no longer distinguish a collection by format anymore, as clearly as you could in the past with analog. Physical storage items impacted their intellectual control as issuable items. But with digital, this is no longer relevant or necessary. In fact, you want to retain a collection together for contextual purposes, dividing up and transferring it to other curatorial areas based on format just makes no sense anymore. And in 2011, actually, the Turnbull Library went under, underwent a really large restructure looking at this, and we moved away from an organisation based on format to really function, or what's kind of called the matrix model. And this actually set up the arrangement and description team. I should emphasise, before this time, Turnbull Library had very much silos based on curatorial sections. And what was unique about my position, I was allowed to go into each of those areas before they were all gelled into one big happy family, so to speak. But during that time period, a lot of arrangement and description practices was happening in isolation from each other. And a lot of people don't realise it, but there was a lot of disparity in some of the arrangement and description regarding some of the stuff, and that's coming to a head. In particular, with our, um, I guess with the digital materials are really pushing, in one respect, the collection management systems that we have. They're really traditionally um, based on analog physical archival collections. And in particular, our beloved Tapui 
system is a is an age bespoke product which was developed before um, developed before the adoption of international archival descriptive standards and it's actually coming to it's coming to the end of its life really and we're hoping to have a replacement system that is compliant with these standards so that our metadata is more easily shared with the world Another thing, of course, is the digital era has really revolutionised the way that information is created and used. Born digital files are easily created, copied, exchanged, conserved and deleted. This means the application of the archival principle of respect to fonts is not as easy as it was to apply. I mean, you look at, like, folders were based on how many physical files you could fit wedge into it, now you get digital file folders on a computer that contain thousands of files. And who do you know who actually created the files in some respects when especially in Microsoft, the beauty of Microsoft, as soon as you open a file you might not even change it and close it, it changes the metadata and behind it so that you're the last person and so forth. And another thing of course with the discoverability and the access to our collections. We acknowledge that the access and delivery is not ideal for our born digital. But the researchers, in honesty, are not fully engaging with these parts of our collections yet, so we really don't know what future expectations will be. I can think of a few, but there could be more. I mean, would they want a keyword search or the born digital content and surface only the relevant files? That would be great. Browse the entire output of a creator. I mean. We got Judith Binney's computer, for instance, and seeing her entire files and seeing how she interacted with them. That would be wonderful. But also, digital archaeology is becoming a really big growing area of research, excavating the chips, as they call it, and understanding the obsolete technologies, which Jay knows all about. <laughs> but I just want to say there's really no silver bullet to any of this, and that's actually what makes it so exciting and rewarding and why I've been working in this role for so long. And, um, yeah, any questions? <laughs> yeah. Do you, have, do you have any issues with, with, um, with digital forensics and with material that had been deleted? I'm thinking about Stanford who have the, um, the sorry, Stanford have the Robert Creeley archive and his, his hard drive, and they recovered from that uh, email that he deleted and also pornography that was in his browser cache. So they had decisions about whether to whether to curate that material or not. Yeah. I mean we get that quite a lot as well, particularly because um, as you probably might not be aware, but a huge amount of our actually writers and creatives actually prefer to use Mac. And we work in a PC environment at work and you actually get to see a lot of stuff that you get the shadow files and all sorts of things. But also we see the bins of course and when you're looking at those um, at those discs, but that really comes down to a curatorial decision. And also, I guess, if they put it in the bin, they had a, they don't want it to come to us in some respects. It comes down to a question. We do bring that up every now and then. Um, and then Michael King, I actually did retrieve quite a lot from his bin, um, particularly when there were partial drafts and things like that. Um, but yeah, for some of the things that comes down, you just have a discussion with the curator, because I mean, I've just been given the collection to work on. I discover some things that perhaps were never intended to be seen by people. Um, yeah, there's, there is some, some <laughs> there is a lot of questions around. I think it's a case by case basis, really, when it comes down to it, though. There's no set policy on it. No, not really. We do save it and then we make decisions, yes. But oh, I should emphasize we do retrieve everything we can at the time and then we make a decision what we have in front of us. Um, usually it comes down to that collection policy and the um, and the curator's decision around retaining particular files. Yeah. But anyway. Any other? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so, are you going to do anything about the interface with the NDHA? We would love to. I mean, we've got a wish list. You, you can, you can talk to that, Jay. Sorry, <laughs> we've got a wish list. It's been growing. When, when you say that, what do you mean? When the, what part of the interface do you want worked on? 
the, the, the public interface for, for browser for getting access to the image, the image viewer and the sure. image <laughs> interface. And, uh, Absolutely. And I think, I think everybody who works in the brand system would say that it's not perfect and it's not beautiful mm -hmm. and we deserve yeah. and we want better things. Uh, there are there's a few kind of R&D stuff that we're working on behind the scenes that we, that we want to push out, but obviously these things take time. Mm. Um, and I think fundamentally, I think what we need to hear, we need to be told the library, so maybe just email Bill and say, hey, <laughs> I want some better tools, because you know, I don't think you're doing your time, uh, you know, the, the, I, I don't think you're displaying in the way that I think is, 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 is as best for that collection. So please say those things and say them loudly yeah. so we can, we can get the mandate to do something about it. Truly, yeah. really, you need to leverage your relationship with these leaders because after all, you did build the product with them. Uh, and yeah. well, so I think we want yeah. to conversation space, which is not, not appropriate for Curtis's talk. My, my response would be, Rosetta is one product, it's a, it's a preservation yeah. mechanism, it's not an access mechanism. Yeah, and that's so the thing. Yeah. Things, yeah. yeah, that's the thing, the preserva yeah, we've been concerned with the preservation, but now we are getting really into the actual providing access and really mining that some of that stuff in behind some of the data that we've got, um, yeah, like some of those digital photographs that have a lot of background metadata to them, but yeah. But any more? Oh, yeah. It's really interesting what you said about the personal information and archiving the media. Yeah. It's so easy. It's so easy now for everyone to say everything. Oh, absolutely. I'm just thinking what's on my computer. Not that it's ever going to be archived, but what a hideous job that would be. So yeah. Um, <laughs> putting in place some kind of, well, if you've got paper or files or photos, Eventually, run out of space. Yeah. So you certainly don't run out of space or hard drive no, space. No, that's true. This is the problem. That's, I mean, that's what we're discovering. Because so every. It's yeah. really interesting you talk about being in an advocacy or an advice role mm. to the public to prepare the book, the material before it comes to you. Yeah, I mean, there, there's some. Over in the States, I know at the Library of Congress, they've run some really interesting workshops with people with concerns about how to manage their own collections. And I think that's a way that we can. Not saying that, that we definitely want all your stuff to come to us, but just educating people how they can better manage their own collections, because in some cases it is just out of hand, just thinking that last collection I mentioned. But there's some really interesting collections, though. Sorry, and I'm probably talking too loudly into that. Um, another collection I worked on a wee while ago, which I um, didn't use as a case point, was Maurice Shadbolt, and if most people don't know, he suffered from Alzheimer's, and so he relied heavily on his computer in the later part of his life, and he expressed quite passionately his, um, his despair, I guess, in losing his words. And I think, as a writer, isn't that the most thing you prize most? And he talked about that um, quite a bit. But also, the actual sheer disorganisation of his files actually dis sort of reflected his disorganised mind. And I think some of that kind of stuff is really interesting as well. I mean, you want to retain, like, he had all these things all over the place, but I kind of questioned, just because there were duplicates everywhere, that actually sort of, dis sort of illustrated how scattered his memory was and you know but anyway that's and that's a case by case basis but yeah yeah anyway so tidying it up from being yeah absolutely yeah. absolutely and that's where context comes back again <laughs> yeah anyway thank you thank you Kirsty.